we'll move into some of the some of the more sort of direct portfolio stuff. I'm not standing here as saying, you know, I've figured everything out, I've figured it all out, and this is exactly what you need to do. But I've just learned a lot along the way. Throughout my career, I've had some, you know, a lot of interviews and got through a lot of rounds at different businesses. And as a senior designer now, I'm reviewing portfolios of applicants who are coming in. And I've just had some great advice along the way from some pretty big hitters in the industry. Um, one of those, uh, this lady, Amina, she wrote a book called Breaking In Product Design. You should go check that out. She interviewed 100 top design directors in the world, all asking them the same questions of what do you look for in a, a, a graduate designer? What do you look for in a portfolio? Can you tell us about a portfolio that's sort of caught your attention in the last six months? All the answers to these 100 design directors out there is in that book, so it's worth checking out. Um, I was fortunate enough to get sort of one-to-one -one advice on my own portfolio from Mina, uh, as well as other guys at places like Fuse Project, IDEO, Nike, Google, um, and I just want to kind of pass some of that on to you guys. So the first thing is that with a portfolio, you might be tempted and think, I need a website. A website is the solution. That's where everything's going. I need a website and pour all your effort into a website. My advice for you guys creating your first portfolio would actually don't do that and go down the PDF route. And the reason is, is that when you, when you design a website for your portfolio, um, you know, there, there are some benefits in the fact that people say, you know, you don't have to send something and attach something and you've got that sort of file size that you're trying to achieve and it's just much easier to send a link. Although some of those are true, there's a tendency, and it's what I've found, is that people just kind of upload everything that they have and aren't very, um, they're not very critical in being ruthless, in thinking very clearly about what they don't put in. And when you design a PDF, because you've got to keep it to this size and because it's showing one page, then another page, then another page, you're in control also of where the reader is. If, you, if I go onto a website, you're not in control now because I can click wherever I want to go. Whereas when you design a PDF, page one, then page two, page three, I have to, I'm channeled into this journey and you decide where I go and how I move through it. Um, so that's just one thing, but the main thing is that it forces you to be very, very thorough about what you put in and what you don't put in and really craft a portfolio that's very concise and every single page is very impactful for, for, for each project, every page is like that. There's just this tendency to sort of have this grid layout of projects and then because each project has a web page, just kind of upload everything you have and not really thinking it through properly. So it would definitely be to start with a PDF. Um, the other thing is, is you know, people happily accept um, a PDF, whereas there are some businesses who, who won't take a link. Um, the other thing is, when you're going for a placement and you're looking at these these uh, opportunities online, a lot of the time it's a lot of the top businesses will say no agencies, please. We don't accept applications from agencies, but y you will kind of want to open yourself up to maximise the amount of possibilities that you can go for. And you know that might be a route is that to get in contact with some recruitment agencies and go through them, and they'll typically want a PDF. Um, you should be using InDesign to create that, and there's no other tool you should be using. So if you're not well versed in InDesign, I suggest you learn that now because there's nothing else you should be using to craft this portfolio. Um, aim for around five meg, don't go over ten. And the other thing is that you want it to just be all in one. Design your, your CV and your portfolio all in one document. There's no reason why you should send a PDF cover letter, another PDF as a CV, and another PDF as a, as a portfolio. You know, when I say it, it doesn't sound right, and it sounds simple, but that's what people do, is they start sending three different documents. Just get it all in one. So one of the main points is that you've got to be showing your process. Um, your portfolio should not look like a catalogue of the products you've designed. You're not trying to sell these products that you've designed. 
um, which goes on to the next point, you're trying to sell you. And so you need to show that process and the way you've arrived at the end solution because if you only ever show renders or images of a final product, I can only judge you based on how much I like the final product. I might not like the design, but if you've shown the process and how you got there, then I might appreciate some of the ideas and some of the sketch work and some of that development work, and I might not like something in particular about the final design, but at least there's something else that I can appreciate. And if you don't put in that process work, then you don't allow for that appreciation. Um, so you've got to be showing your process through sketch work and prototyping and, and everything about how you got there. Um, and it's about mainly your thinking. You've got to show your thinking visually. Um, so this is something which is if I can't see it, you can't do it. Um, and this is something that I took from uh, a company in Manchester. I wasn't long out of university and I'd landed an interview at this design consultancy and there were so many things that I knew I could do and I just wasn't showing evidence of them. And it was really frustrating because I'm sat there in the interview knowing that I'm capable of all these skills they're looking for um, and there just wasn't enough evidence of some of it. And so it's just that idea that you know, if you're not showing evidence, then how else are they meant to know that you're capable of it? Um, you know, so a good idea is to list out all the skills that you've got you know, whether you can do really nice illustrator line work, um, digital sketching, nice hand renderings, um, you know, Photoshop renderings, all these types of different skills that you've got, prototyping and testing, you need to show evidence of them. So if you create that list first and then just make sure that you're showing evidence of those through projects, you're kind of making sure that you're conveying multiple skills and evidence of those skills. The other thing is you've got to show your best work there's, there's no point putting anything in there that you're not proud of. Um, if you show something that's absolutely great, something that's awesome and something that's really good and stop there, you've got more chance of landing that interview rather than showing something that's awesome, something that's good, you know, something that's down here, another thing that's good, something that's down here. It's not about the quantity of the amount of work you show. You don't have to show that many projects to convey your quality if it's done right. So focus on the quality of the work. The other thing is that there's absolutely no reason why there should be anything um, of a poor standard because you guys have got the time. If you didn't like a, a, a particular bit of work from a project you did, you've got the time to go back and address that and retrospectively go back and do that work and improve it and bring it to the standard that you know it should be. So there's absolutely no excuse to have anything that you're not proud of. Um, another thing is that it's important to know that the goal of that application portfolio is not to land a job, it's to land the interview. And when you realize that, it's a game changer because loads of crap will just start coming out of the portfolio you need to realize that you don't need to tell the full story and every detail of every project. All you're trying to do is just create enough intrigue for them to go, okay, yeah, bring her in for interview. When you have that mindset of thinking you need to tell the full story, you start clogging up the portfolio with loads of paragraphs and loads of words trying to describe and explain everything and what happens is, is you lose all visual impact. Um, and this portfolio, it needs to be visually impactful. If you're trying to land a job as a designer, you know, we're in a visual business and you need to make visual impact. The other thing is that the way people are gonna skim through portfolios is slightly different for engineering, um, but particularly if you're going for a design role, it, it needs to be visual. And so you need to tell the story visually and not just through massive blocks of text because no one's got the time to read them. You've kind of got to design your portfolio for headline readers. They might read a heading and a subheading and they're flicking through that portfolio so quickly that they're looking more at the images and they're not really going to read these large paragraphs of text. So you need to cater for headline readers. So this is something, yeah, before, like 
I've done so many um, portfolio reviews at uh, the V&A Museum, actually, with Artsthread um, and around sort of new designers exhibition. And we flick through the portfolio and people are apologising for projects that are in there saying, oh, yeah, that one was from first year. You can kind of move past that one. If you know that that's true, then you need to take it out or retrospectively go back and redo it. There's no reason why you should have it in there because if you're sat there as a second year design student thinking that it's not very good and it shouldn't be in there, a design director, senior designer, design manager is just going to rip it apart um, and you'll just be sat there wanting to skip on. So, you know, if it's not good enough and you know that, you need to take it out. This is one of the main points. So I, I also run this portfolio improvement program. Um, so mainly it's people in America getting in touch, sort of wanting their portfolio improving. And one of the absolute main points that I talk about is clarifying the premise of the project right at the beginning. Because there's nothing worse, and it happens really frequently with portfolios. For a certain project, you might be four or five pages into that project, and you still don't know what it's all about. You're asking yourself, what's the point? Um, and I'm sure when you're looking at other students' work in some projects, you'll be kind of be very critical of other people's work, thinking, what's the point in that? Why is that any good? Why does that even exist? Well, employers are asking the same questions, and if you're not clarifying that right at the beginning, you make it difficult to them to connect with the work. And if you clarify the premise right at the beginning, um, with just a really sort of short, punchy message or question that just makes them understand the project and, and the whole point behind it. What it means is, is that when you then clarify the problem that you're addressing, it means that in your sort of idea generation pages and you're showing all these ideas and these concepts, I can then connect with your sketch pages on a much deeper level because I'm looking at your response to what you've just clarified. And it just allows that much deeper connection um, because you've set out, look, here's the problem, and now you're showing ideas around a solution. And rather than just looking at those sketch pages and thinking, oh, those are now sketches, we go that one level deeper and we start going, oh, I can see what he's trying to do there. I can see, oh, that's one way he solved that problem and here's another way. And that's where you start communicating the thought process that you went on. So what I was talking about at the beginning of communicating the process is so important. Um, so this is definitely a big part of that is to fully clarify um, what it is that you're addressing. Another question I get, you guys will have so many different skills and you've just got to be aware of, of those skills, how many of them are actually really core to you being able to design great products. And so you might be a great photographer. I've seen product design portfolios that are 22 pages long that the final eight pages were personal photography. Now that's just detrimental because yes, if you're, you can take great photographs, that's a good skill to have as a designer, but it's, it's nothing in comparison to the ability to design great products. So first and foremost, above everything else, make sure that you're communicating and responding to what the actual job is. And if it's to be a mechanical engineer, then make sure, it seems so simple, right? But just make sure that you're proving that you're a great mechanical engineer above anything else, because um, that's what the job is. And so just assess all these things that you want to put in of you know, you designed a logo for a basketball team in your town, great, maybe show it in the interview if you land it, but you just start clouding the real core skill set that you should be conveying when you sort of clog it up with all these side skills. Uh, this is another thing I talk about, I just want to talk about portfolios. Um, kind of comes back to what I was saying earlier about making sure you're showing evidence because and this is mainly for, for CVs as well, and it's kind of just about sticking to the point and, and being factual in what you say. Um, and you might express a belief, but if you sit there and say, I'm a highly creative individual, it means nothing. When you say, I'm a highly creative individual and I can solve problems, 
it does nothing to change my mind of how creative I think you are. Now, if you've shown me a design project with some great visuals that was really creative, or the way that you submitted your application, or just the way you've solved the problem in a project, and you've documented and presented that well, that's the right way to show me that you're creative, not to write a sentence saying, I'm highly creative. It does absolutely nothing. It means nothing. Um, and so it's just something I see time and time again where people come out with just the most ridiculous statements about themselves with absolutely no evidence to back it up. So silent validation is, you know, you're not saying you're creative, you're proving it. Um, and that's the key difference. And you just got to make sure that whatever you think about yourself, you know, nobody else might think that. But if you believe it, you've just got to make it your responsibility to prove that in a visual way through evidence and validate it. Um, it's just, just a key point there. Um, another thing to bear in mind is that it's a global stage now. So we've got a, an office in Shanghai and we employ people from all over the world in that office. Um, and we've got an office uh, in Datchet, just outside Windsor. And again, we employ people from all over the world. So because it's a global stage, if you're the best at this university, it's, it's a small pond. It's one university. So never ever sort of get complacent or thinking that you're doing great because you're comparing yourself to the people in your class. You've got to think globally um, and, and sort of set the highest standards on, on this world stage. The other thing is, is that when you're applying for placements, you've got graduates who haven't landed jobs, who've got more experience than you, who are desperate to land those placements. Um, when you eventually graduate and you're trying to land a job, there are people who graduated the year before um, and the business, uh, and you're competing against those people, but the business who's chosen to hire you, they, they're weighing that up against whether they should spend a bit more money and hire a senior designer, right? Do they even need that role? And so when you think about it, you, you, you're in competition with absolutely everyone. Not just the people in your class, not just the people in your country, not you know, you're competing against someone with six years more experience than you. And so just bear that in mind and it just makes you up your game when you realise how big that competition is. Um, this is something else, which is to go beyond the academic criteria. Um, you might have been set a particular brief at university. And you set a brief and you respond to that brief and you've got to anticipate the fact that an employer in an interview might ask you questions that, you know, they might not know exactly what the brief was and what the scope of the work was. They're just trying to look for some great engineering work and some great design work. And so either A, clarify exactly what you were asked to do so that they know what was out of scope, but it's highly likely that you know, they might ask you about particular aspects of it that weren't in the scope of the project. And you kind of need to think about that. And if a project was just a two week project and it only got to a certain point, the, the real thing that I'm saying here is there's no reason why you have to stop just because the project stopped. And so if you're set a three week project and it ended, but you really liked it. That project doesn't have to just sit still in time. You can go back, redo it, continue it, develop it, build prototypes, go and test it, go and uh, use it in its intended environment, go and find people who are the users. And so when you're asked that question, like you are at the end of projects of, oh, what would you do again? If you, you, know, if you could do the project, what would you do differently? You can respond with, well, actually, I, you know, I did think about that and I went and did it and this is where I took it to. And, and just bear that in mind that just because a project stops, it doesn't mean you have to, and you can take these things and go much further with them. Um, another thing just to bear in mind is there's a great community on Instagram um, for design uh, and engineers, industrial designers. There's a, just a great community there. And it's also 
just an amazing um, platform for you to just be documenting your journey, building an audience, learning from others. And when I say it's a global stage, you'll see that when you engage in this community, you'll realize the standard that other people are at and it will make you up your game as well. So I would highly recommend getting involved in that community that's on Instagram. Um, yeah, there's, there's just a lot in there. Um, and another thing is that with the placement, you know, you might not land the placement that you really want. You might, there's a chance you might end up designing air filters for a brand you've never heard of and it's not the job you wanted. And you've just got to kind of bear in mind that, all right, do a great job of that even so and work harder so that, you know, you can land the job you want afterwards at the end of graduating. And you've got to be very persistent. There'll be knockdowns and you've just got to keep going. And so does anyone know who that is, by the way? Ron? Walt Disney. Yeah, Walt Disney. So you might already know this story, but Walt Disney had the idea for Disneyland. Um, but he had no money to make it happen. And so he had this idea that was going to bring all this joy and entertainment and delight to everyone's lives. And he went to a bank and applied for a loan to make Disneyland happen, this dream that he had. And the bank basically laughed him out of the building, um, didn't get the money, and he went to a second bank. They laughed him out of the building. Went to a third bank, still no, everyone was just rejecting him. How many people here, after being told three times by managers at banks that it's not an idea worth pursuing, would just kind of say, yeah, maybe I'll just leave it there. You've got to keep going. Walt Disney went to 302 banks before someone gave him the money um, to make Disneyland happen and, and look what he's achieved with that. So I would just say, look, if you don't land the placement that you want, you've just got to keep going and keep going. And if you don't, and if you're not, if you're landing interviews and you're not landing jobs, it's just a matter of time and persistence with this. And the portfolio is something that you're going to be improving and developing for potentially the next 20 years. Um, and so, you know, although you're starting now, it's, it's a long process. It's not like you create this portfolio once or even twice or three times. It's something to stay on top of and you're going to be continuously improving it um, for the next couple of decades. So just kind of stick with it. Um, I have a blog on my site, nickchubdesign.com. Um, like I said before, I post a lot of content that tries to benefit students like yourselves. This was a post that I wrote about um, sort of project ideas for product design students. I've written others about how to land placements um, and different roles of different tools within design. It's just a bit of a resource that I've kind of been continually adding to. So that's another thing just to check out. Um, and yeah, that's uh, my talk and I think we'll open it up for some Q&A, but thank you very much. Cheers. <clears throat> cool. Go on, fella. Did you um, change how you sort of tailored your portfolio towards the specific company you applied for? So say if you're going to a small design consultancy or if you're applying to you know, someone like Nike or uh, IDEO or something like that, how things have changed? Absolutely, yeah. So if you're applying to a business and you know that sort of um, being able to design mechanical solutions is more important to them and to another business maybe that sort of sensitivity to visual brand language and form might be more appropriate then when you're a sort of senior designer and you've got a shed load of products out in the market and you've developed all sorts of products you kind of base your decision of what projects to include based on what matters to the business. Just because you might only have four projects, you can still take the same mindset in that you can change what you focus on. And so in, in a single project, there might be so many different aspects to it. And so it's just changing, shifting the focus of what the project is showing. And so absolutely, it'd be a case of going through and figuring out What's important to them? What types of clients do they work for? What types of products? Is there going through their own portfolio and looking for similarities in the projects that they do and figuring out, well, what skills would be required for these projects and kind of shifting that more of a focus and spin into your work? Would you say there's any difference if you're going uh, on the size of the, of the consultancy or company you're going to work for? No. 
Doesn't change anything. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the projects we do are, are group ones as well. And when you're trying to document that work in the portfolio, do you think it's best to only focus on the bits that you've done or sort of give a bigger picture and just you know, Yeah, yeah, this this question comes up a lot. So it's basically how do you deal with group projects? Um my answer to this is always some people mostly what happens is they're not totally happy with the actual end solution of a group project and sometimes they feel like they would have done it slightly differently like i said before there's no reason why that just has to remain still as a moment in time it's going into your portfolio so redesign it to the way that you wanted it would be my advice but you can show where the group got to and then you can go, right, well, this is the direction I took it in and you can state why. So there's just, there's just no barrier to you doing that piece of work and changing it to what you want. In terms of including group work, that's, that is absolutely fine because there are, you know, like I showed the Armadillo flip push chair. That's three designers, one design researcher, four engineers and a design manager. You know, so it's okay to include group work. People understand that design is done within teams, but like you said, just detail, well, what, if there's an area that you focused on, so for instance, on that push chair, I spent quite a lot of time on the backrest, and there's a lever at the back that you pull and, and the look and the form, and um, there's a handle below. And so in a portfolio, I just focus more on those areas. So I think show the whole thing, expand on the areas that you focused on, but if you do want to go that step further, then refine the design to what you believe in more than what was the output of the group project. Cool. Go on, fellow. Um, assuming that you get your interview and you interview and they ask you to bring a portfolio, yeah. um, should you just whip out your laptop and like, just stick to the slides? Should you like, print it off or do you redo it? Or? I just wrote a blog post about that. So um, basically, it's question was print or digital portfolio for an interview the first comment is your interview portfolio should have more than your application portfolio it's a different portfolio so we have an application portfolio and an interview portfolio the application portfolio is just trying to land you the interview um, and that's why we start stripping stuff out and making it highly visual is because that's its purpose the interview the Portfolio for the interview is where you're then telling the full story. You don't have to meet some, it must be less than six meg, because you know, you're just arriving, you're in control, you, it can be as big as you want. So for an interview, in terms of presentation, I would personally always go digital. Um, I just, there are no benefits to having a print portfolio. Um, mainly like the cost of you doing a print portfolio means that and just sort of the time and effort and getting that and making it nice what it means is is that when if you just have this print portfolio and I go digital and I've got a PDF you're lugging that around to every interview you land whereas me with my PDF if I need to tweak two words or six pages I'm going to do it for each individual business. You're probably not going to spend 60, 70 quid getting that redone every time. And so my applications would just be more, more focused on, on what that person needs. But although sort of that overall portfolio should be shown digitally, in my opinion, I would definitely be taking sketchbooks with you. So you want to be taking sketchbooks. You want to be taking um, prototypes and models and... You know, we're in a physical business. We're designing physical products. So, you know, if you've got prototypes that work and explain things, take those with you. Um, another idea is, um, you know, if you want to land a job at a consultancy, all these consultancies are presenting to clients every week and they'll have a decent setup for doing that. So why not harness that, ring ahead and say, look, in the interview room, is there going to be a screen? Am I able to use it to present to you guys? Yes, obviously, take your stick, present using their system. Then you're presenting to them in the same way that they present to their clients. It's a lot better than sitting there with an eight-inch iPad. Um, saying that, 
the iPad can work, especially if you've got an iPad Pro nice and big, that can work equally as well. So I wouldn't say you have to have a print portfolio, you have to have digital, go print if you want, I just don't see many benefits to it. Um, but definitely it wants to be more than what you, what you show in the application portfolio. Is that yeah, answer your question? Cool. Yeah? Um, if you do a very big project and you have objectives and ideation and then you also have CAD and prototypes and the actual finished product, yeah. do you include all of that in one page or how would you define? Not in one page. So what we typically say is kind of start off with, say, a hero shot, you know, because then it just frames up the whole project. A really nice hero shot that just that sort of shot that shows it in context and just makes you kind of totally get what it is, who it's for, and, and there's so many things that you can capture in just a, a really great hero shot. Um, and I would normally say have that sort of punchy message or statement that kind of is explaining what you're actually addressing as well in that page. You then kind of want to frame up, well, what were the specific insights? So if that was on one page, Another separate page would be just kind of highlighting what were the specific problems that needed to be addressed. What were the specific insights that you drew out through your research that needed addressing? I would kind of stick that on another page. Next page would then be sort of ideation and sketch pages because you've just framed up what needs to be solved. Now you're showing me ideas of your way of thinking of how you could solve that problem. See how there's just a, such a natural flow. So that page will normally be, say, like the overall format and architecture of the product. Normally when there's a, a problem that needs to be solved, if it's highly complex, you won't be getting into the details of, say, the visual form and aesthetics straight away. Um, nor will you be getting into the details of a particular mechanism straight away. Normally there's kind of a more sort of top level overall format of the product that, that needs to be explored. And so I would kind of normally have that as that first sketch page. Then maybe go zoom in a level deeper in maybe one aspect of the product. That if you're going for an engineering role, maybe you focus on what the mechanical solution that needed to be created for that project. Maybe you go into that aspect of it and there's a full sketch page that's all about this particular mechanism. Or if you want to go for um, a slightly different role, and you think that sort of visual form is something that they care about, then maybe that second sketch page is focusing more on visual form and an exploration of that. And so then another logical page after that would be the prototyping. Maybe there's uh, you know proof, proof of concept models for a mechanism, or maybe it's just sort of visual block models. So it's kind of dependent on what you want to draw attention to, but you are splitting it out across these different areas, not just kind of lumping everything together on one page. Because that's the fastest way to lose visual impact if you start putting way too much on one page. Typically less is more in a portfolio and just kind of focusing on one particular thing. Yeah. With reference to um, the insights page, how would we be able to display this in a way that is much more text? Yeah, so that's, that's the skill. Ah. <laughs> Is, uh, is, is to break that down. And so, so for instance, I designed a um, project I worked on was a wetsuit washer, right? So the whole thing was when you're washing a wetsuit, if you have to dunk it in a barrel, which is one of the existing methods, then the idea is that after that first dunk, you're then just washing your wetsuit in dirty water. The other method, which is people just hang it on a normal hanger and spray it, is that you have to be there you're getting wet and cold. People spend $600 on a wetsuit and they really care about maintaining the shape of the suit and these hangers kind of destroy the shape of the suit around the shoulder area. And so the hanger wasn't designed for it and it wastes your time and you get cold and wet and it also doesn't wash the inside of the suit. So those were the problems. So what I did was create illustrations that weren't created. This is what I mean about the website. You're not, it's not just about presenting the work that you did in the project, you might have to do extra work to help frame these things. So I went and created illustrations that showed what those existing methods were. You know, so I'm visually, that story that I've just told you about those problems, that's visually documented, but it was illustrations that were created specifically 
for telling that story. It wasn't work that I did in the project, but it helps frame up the project and the context in that portfolio. So that's kind of uh, one example. Yeah? You mentioned that um, PDFs can be the first option for a site portfolio. Um, in that instance, how would you go about um, maybe including video material? Is it best to link it or just sort of leave it out? To just kind of I would say do that in the interview. You could embed a video or, or stick a link in. That's yeah, nothing against that. It's absolutely fine. Um, but that's an opportunity as well about the whole print versus digital in the interview. If you've taken an iPad with you and you've got videos of prototypes being tested, well, that's, you know, you've, having an iPad there or showing it on screen is much better for that as well. And if you want to show an animation or a GIF or a video of something happening, having that print portfolio doesn't really allow for that as well. So that's just another benefit of the uh, digital. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. You, you get to a point where you kind of you turn up to an interview just with a backpack on with loads of like prototypes and all these different types of stuff. But honestly, that you, you can't take enough stuff to an interview. Um, just to being able, like you know, when if you've got like a really nice mechanism that you've designed, you've done everything, and it's really nice, why wouldn't you take that with you? Um, so absolutely, yeah. Know your projects inside out because more often than not, you're presenting your portfolio and I'm asking you questions about it. But that seems obvious, but I've asked people in interviews, so what material would that be? And then asked them why, but they didn't even know what material it was going to be, let alone why it might be specified a particular material. So that's an example of one where... And more looking if, you know, your knowledge of material selection, of me saying what material is that, but looking for you to say why, I kind of uncover that you really know what you're talking about. And so that would just be one. But I'd say make sure you know your own projects and all the design decisions that went along the way. Just make sure you know those inside out. Um, and knowing the alternatives to the way something could have been done. Um, so if you're designing a particular product and it's got, it incorporates a certain technology, a common question would be, well, did you think of this? Why did you go down that route? If there's kind of six different ways in which that one thing could be achieved, you need to know, you know, why did it, did it go too narrow too soon in the project? And do you actually know how else it could have worked and why that was the most effective route to go down? So that'd be another one, but you know, there'd be so many examples to give. Go on. Uh, so There's no medal, by the way. <laughs> uh, I was just asking about the interview. So suppose you've got the interview, you've got out your portfolio. Yeah. Um, I don't, know if I don't think an iPad does that. But. Yeah. So <laughs> where you laugh, you know, we have to do that with clients. You know, you're developing a project, it's at a particular stage in a presentation yeah. and developing concept, it's absolutely hiding them under the table or in a bag and bringing them out when it's appropriate else. You know, you're just going to have design manager and a senior designer pissing about with a prototype while you actually <laughs> want to continue talking about something that you care about because it'll just start playing with something. So yeah. it's up to you to drive... This is, this is something I'd say actually for an interview is don't go in there as a passenger. Don't go in there thinking I'm here to answer questions and kind of be interviewed. You should have a very good idea of what your skill set is, what do they care about, what are they actually wanting to see in someone. You should be anticipating what those things are that you should be communicating that you're good at and you should be driving the conversation. So 
if you're taking more responsibility in driving that conversation and going in there thinking this is something this is a point I want to get across I want to say this I want to show this you can kind of present what what you believe is important as well obviously they're going to be driving the conversation mainly but if you've got that in your back pocket and you're prepared then you can almost when questions get asked you can steer it down a particular route and answer in a certain way that allows you to show what you want to show um, so that would just be something to bear in mind go on Michael how do you I would say don't worry about that too much. People say, like, oh, you, sh- you should convey your personality. I just want to know that you can design great products first and foremost. And so your output of your project and the process work and all that thinking, y- you do all that right and I'll kind of get a flavour of what you like as a designer. Make sure that's good enough and you'll land the interview. So don't worry about conveying personality in an application portfolio because if that's good enough, just focus on making that good enough, then you'll get brought in for an interview. And an application portfolio is never going to convey your personality as much as an interview and me meeting you face to face. 